I invite you to stand as we receive the Holy Gospel according to St. Mark, the ninth chapter. So John said to him, that is to Jesus, a teacher, we saw someone casting out demons in your name, and we tried to stop him because he was not following us. But Jesus said, do not stop him, for no one who does a mighty work in my name will be able soon afterward to speak evil of me, for the one who is not against us is for us. For truly I say to you, whoever gives you a cup of water to drink because you belong to Christ will by no means lose his reward. Now whoever causes one of these little ones who believes in me to sin, it would be better for him if a great millstone were hung around his neck and he were thrown into the sea. And if your hand causes you to sin, well, cut it off. It is better for you to enter life crippled than with two hands to go to hell, to the unquenchable fire. And if your foot causes you to sin, cut it off. It is better for you to enter life lame than with two feet to be thrown into hell. And if your eye causes you to sin, tear it out. It is better for you to enter the kingdom of God with one eye than with two eyes to be thrown into hell where their worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. For everyone will be salted with fire. Now salt is good, but if the salt has lost its saltiness, how will you make it salty again? Have salt in yourselves and be at peace with one another. This is the gospel of our Lord. Praise to you, o Christ. You may be seated. These are hard words of Jesus, and we pray in our song, uh, sermon song this morning, that the Spirit would enter us, that we might receive these words from Jesus and our hearts be melted according to his love and grace and mercy. Grace, mercy, and peace be unto you this day from God, our Heavenly Father, from our Lord and our Savior, who is Jesus the Christ, and from the powerful Holy Spirit, 
one God, now and forever. Amen. The texts which serves as a basis for our meditation this morning are those hard words of Jesus that we heard in our gospel lesson this morning. I'm wondering if any of you know what this is. Ever heard it? Yeah, it's a mousetrap, isn't it? Simple piece of wood with some bent metal, right? But effective, isn't it? Yeah. Well, today, uh, in our gospel lesson, we have uh, Jesus speaking these words about uh, if, you're, if you sin, or if you fall into sin. And there's actually uh, just one word in the original language, uh, which is the word scandalon, which means our envisions a trap being set, a trap being set, like a mouse trap. Um, if, if you fall into a trap, or if you are trapped, is what that word uh, really talks about today in Jesus uh, teaching us today. Um, and this all comes on uh, Jesus' words last week, um, really talking about the, the uh, disciples' pride, right? And we heard uh, them uh, talking about who was the greatest in the kingdom, and Jesus uh, redirecting their thoughts and their notions to seeing uh, the value of servanthood as being the greatest uh, thing that uh, they could do with their life is to serve. And today uh, we, uh, we do actually celebrate the servanthood of our women, especially in the Lutheran Women's Missionary League. And at the end of our service, we're actually going to sing their theme song, which uh, was created by, um, by a uh, Lutheran pastor um, when L.W. Mel Canada first formed. A beautiful song that we'll be using later on in our service. So uh, today, we're not really talking so much about pride, but it's evil twin jealousy. Jealousy, because we hear um, John uh, go up to Jesus today and, and inform him of this man that was casting out demons in Jesus' name. And uh, John is going like, Jesus, stop him. He's not one of us. That is, he's not one of the 12 that you called to be your disciple. He's not a follower, right? He doesn't belong. Stop him. And Jesus uh, tells John and the rest of the disciples, you got it wrong again. He got it wrong again. It's not about this man and, and him casting out demons because what, what was the power that was casting out demons? It was the power of Jesus' name, right? That's where the power rests, in Jesus' name. And furthermore, uh, Jesus talks to them about what is it that actually joins you to this man that you want to cast out, that you want to separate from yourselves he says, isn't it the same thing? Isn't it the name of Jesus that brings you all together as one to serve as servants? And so we're going to think about those things that prevent us, separate us, and divide us in this world. And we certainly are living in a world filled with divisions these days. We're really heading in that uh, way of tribalism, of figuring out who belongs to our tribe and who doesn't. It's we against them. That seems to be the way that our world is going, and, you know, it has an effect on us, doesn't it? It has an effect on us. And it has an effect, then, on those who gather as God's people as well. This separation, these divisions that we have, whether intentional or unintentional, young against old, you know, whether uh, we have, we've been in the faith for so long or we just started, maybe you're a newbie and somebody else is not quite there yet, but we have all of these divisions, right, in the church, and we can really accentuate that and bring them to the fore. And Jesus has uh, a word of warning to us today about that, about that sin of jealousy, about the temptation, the trap 
that set, besets us all. I have some very stern words for us today, so let us uh, begin with a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, you sent your Son into our world to seek the lost, to save those who are trapped in this land of darkness and despair, separated and lonely. We pray through the power of your Holy Spirit to stir within us a compassion, a concern for those who think that they are beyond hope, beyond your saving grace, who see themselves as being divided from you, separated from you. We pray that you would protect us and keep us from all of those snares of condemnation that would seek to divide and bring divisions among your people and restore to us a sense of value and potential for all life and for the growth of your kingdom as you bring together those who were once divided into one. This we ask in the precious and holy name of Christ. Amen. Dear friends, have you ever felt trapped? Have you ever felt like maybe you're trapped in a life of insignificance, of futility? Have you ever felt like you're trapped by your pride, by your fears or anxiety? Have you ever felt trapped by illness? Has life sprung something upon you? and you feel trapped. Perhaps this day you feel a particular sin that you're trapped in, firmly in its jaws. Well, you're not alone. I think all of us at one time or another has felt trapped. And those traps as Jesus points out, lead to death. They're serious. The death trap of sin snapped upon the disciples. In their pride and in their jealousy, the disciples wanted to snuff out this man, this little one of faith in Jesus. And Jesus tells them it would be better for them if they put a millstone around their heads and be plunged into the sea than to allow their temptation to jealousy lead them to quash the faith of this little one. Now, you'll remember that this text comes to us when Jesus, shortly before Jesus would be betrayed, would be arrested, would be crucified. See, Jesus' time with his disciples was growing close. And they would have to endure many things. And so that he might prepare them for the coming time, Jesus lifts up the veil to show the disciples the myriad of death traps that were surrounding them, that were threatening them, that had closed in upon them. Their pride, their jealousy would lead them into temptation and to the death of their faith in him as their savior. Now think about all those things that they were yet to, that were yet to fall upon them. Judas' betrayal, Peter's denial, all of them abandoning him, the various controversies in the early church that threatened to divide and conquer them, pitting Jew against Gentile, one against another, endless, endless death traps. So what death traps lay ahead of you, threaten you? What pathways of temptation are your pride and jealousy leading you down today that 
that see you being separated from faith in Christ. What death traps of sin have been laid against your hand, your foot, your eye? See, Jesus doesn't uh, deal with theoretical things, does he? He brings it down to a real physical reality. You got a hand, you got feet, you got eyes. Three times Jesus mentions hell or Gehenna in the original language. And by this, he really intends to show the disciples that what he's teaching them is really a matter of life and death, of heaven and hell. Now, Gehenna was really a a, a real place. It is uh, located at the base of uh, one of the mountain peaks upon which Jerusalem was situated. It's the place where the, the people would go to throw their, their trash away. But more than that, it was a place where people wanted to throw their unwanted stuff away, including their unwanted children. In that place, the fires were continuously being stoked to burn up all the unwanted, all the tossed out things of the people. And on the updrafts of that fire rose the disgusting, palatable fumes of burning flesh and refuse. Jesus quotes Isaiah's description when he says, where the worm does not die and the fire is not quenched, to describe this place called hell. Imagine your body continuously decaying with maggots crawling in and out of you, but you're still alive and feeling it. Imagine the horror of your flesh burning, the putrid stench, the searing pain, and it goes on and on and on, and you never go unconscious. And hell is worse than even that. That's the end game of sin. That's the end game of temptation. That's the end game of Satan. That's the trap that is set for you and for me. And that's what Jesus reveals to his disciples. That is at the the heart of his concern for them. They're ending up in hell. Now, I think we can all appreciate that there is no earthly gain or glory, no amount of of health or wealth or pleasure or fame or fortune that is worth that kind of eternity, that kind of destiny to live in hell. There's nothing in this world so precious, so cherished, that that is worth holding on to if it would mean that we would be dragged into hell. Even a hand or foot or an eye, as precious as our body parts are, are not worth hanging on to if our clasping on to it would drag us into hell. And so the scriptures continuously warn us to flee from sin and anything that would be a death trap to us because it is not worth it. Now, we all know that. We all believe that. But why is it that we're so quickly drawn into walking right into those death traps? You see, friend, the root of the problem isn't the things that are outside of us, is it? There are many things in this world that lure us. But even running the other way from them will not make our hearts any better. See, a few chapters back, we heard Jesus teach the disciples and us. He said, from within, out of a man's heart comes evil thoughts, sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, greed, malice, deceit, lewdness, envy, slander, arrogance, folly, and all the rest of it. The reality is, cut off a hand and you still have another. Cut off a foot and you still have another. Cut out an eye and you still have another. You will run out of body parts before you run out of sin. (laughs) 
you cannot get ahead of the game. That's the work of the law. It reveals sin and its awful consequences to us. It condemns us as sinners through and through. We are those fallen people, people who have fallen into those death traps. And this was certainly the despair that Luther felt in his life. Despair of life itself. There's an old uh, German fairy tale entitled The Frog Prince or Frog King and Iron Henry. Uh, some of you who come from a uh, German background, you might be familiar with this, with this uh, fairy tale. It's about a, a prince, a princess, who goes to a well to draw water for her failing father. However, the water in the well has turned murky. And along comes this frog who promises her that he will provide her with clean water from the well if only she become his girlfriend. And so the girl agrees. She draws clear water from the well to take to her father. And later in the evening, the frog comes to her window and reminds the girl of, of her promise. And so she lets him in. And this happens three nights in a row, at which time the girl says to the frog, this is the last time. And the next morning she awakes to the presence of not a frog, but a prince. The faithfulness of the girl to her promise broke the curse that had been laid upon the frog prince. And the moral of the fairy tale is about the importance of keeping promises. Well, what does a frog prince have to do with our text today? A friend Isaiah once spoke of our Savior as the one who had no beauty. The faithful one whom upon him was laid the curse of all humanity. He had no form, Isaiah said, or majesty that we should look at him, and no beauty that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief, and as one from whom men hide their faces, he was despised, and we esteemed him not. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him not, stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. Friends, perhaps we could say that Jesus is the frog prince, the prince hidden in a frog form. Jesus endured the rightful punishment for our sins that we might be released from our death trap. He is the faithful one, the, the one who faithfully fulfilled his promise to break his people free from their death traps, from sin and Satan and even hell itself. And he did it by dying on the cross, being placed in the ground called Golgotha, the place of the skull, another garbage dump like Gehenna. And the fairy tale, there's this sub-character named Henry who is bound in iron fetters. But when the curse upon the prince was broken, the fetters uh, uh, that were bound, binding uh, Henry burst open, and Henry was set free. And that's us, isn't it? We are those Henrys. You see, hell is not our destiny. Heaven is. Jesus declared our freedom when he said, so if the Son sets you free, you will be free indeed. Jesus' intention was never to cause the disciples to despair of life. Instead, he speaks of another fire, not a fire of torments, but a fire that's like salt. Salt purifies and preserves and Jesus says, everyone will be salted with fire. This kind of salt is good. 
But if it loses its saltiness, how can you make it salty again? Have salt in yourselves and be at peace with each other. Can we see ourselves as that iron Henry? What is it that can penetrate to the very depths of our heart and soul, cutting away the death traps from within us? What is the salt that kills the bacteria of sin and preserves us for eternal life? What is it that can purify our hearts and sanctify us, making us pure and holy before the Lord God? Listen to what Jesus says in his prayer in John 17. Father, sanctify them by the truth. Your word is truth. See, God's word is a salt that penetrates your heart to sanctify you so that those death traps are cut away and you are set free and set apart for God. God's word, the Holy Scriptures, baptism, the Lord's Supper, absolution, these things bring you Jesus and, in his, and, and, uh, and to his blood that was shed for you. For the blood of Jesus purifies us from all sin. Have this salt in yourselves, dear friends. Keep yourselves in God's word. Don't lose the saltiness by neglecting the scriptures, your baptism, holy absolution, the sacrament of the altar. As this word dwells in us, in all of its fullness and richness, we are being transformed day by day Instead of pride and jealousy separating us, we have forgiveness that brings us together and a peace that exists because of Christ and his name who binds us together as one in peace with one another, in peace with God. Instead of despairing of life, we celebrate the newness of life, not only for ourselves, but also for others. Even those who don't look like us or act like us or speak like us. The power of God's word transforms us. It changes us from being inward looking, turns us to be outward and upward looking, making every effort to keep the bonds of peace and to extend those bonds of peace with more and more people, iron hairnaries all, who lived as we have once lived, trapped to temptation, to sin and death, who are enduring a living hell. Your friends, today we give thanks to God for those faithful servant women who've heard the message of the gospel, and who have been inspired and transformed by the power of God's word to be his servant people, to aid and to support the work of the church, to reach out to the world in which we live. Your friends, this day Christ comes to you and into you. He has burst whatever iron bands you feel in your life. Be assured of the faithful one's promise that even the deepest and darkest sin within your heart, his blood purifies. You have peace, the peace of being reconciled to God. And very shortly, we'll have that great opportunity to share that peace with one another. You have that peace of eternal life that no hell can rob you of. This is the peace that we have the joy to proclaim to one another as God's word salts our hearts. Amen. And now may the peace of God, which surpasses all of our understanding, guard and keep our hearts and our minds through Christ Jesus, to whom be the glory both now and forever. Amen.